Hey everybody, thank you for joining. Happy Wednesday once again. Um, this is becoming a regular thing. We should really stop seeing each other like this. People are gonna start to talk. <laughs> Uh, this is episode 29 of the drop set. I appreciate everyone who is joining in live on Instagram. Thank you all for coming there. Um, and then uh, anybody who's watching on YouTube, you're up here. Instagram, you're down here. Um, and then uh, for all of those of you who may be listening, um, just audio only. So um, you're going to miss out on the visual delight that is my rocking Star Wars t-shirt here. Um, and then all of the visual aids that I have planned for today, which um, spoiler alert, there are none. So you're not missing too much. Um, but yeah, episode 29. So here we go. Um, we've got a couple topics that we're going to cover today. One of them is just talking about protein. It's going to be a little bit of a um, <laughs> Instagram is filmed in a new location, says TMAC. Yeah, um, different angle this time. So I'm trying, trying to mix it up, keep people guessing. Um, so we're going to talk protein a little bit. Um, it's going to be a, a topic, uh, a conversation that um, covers a few different levels. So we're going to talk very basic stuff and then get into things a little bit more detailed as well. Um, and then something that um, I, I thought about just ranting about this, but I'm going to make it an entire topic and that is gym etiquette. So um, I have blogged about this in the past. I have uh, talked about it regularly. I just bitch and moan incessantly about it. So we're going to learn everything that we need to know about um, being a good citizen of the gym. So when the time comes for that discussion, I would love to hear anybody else's uh, stories or um, anything else that you would like to add to the conversation that will help tremendously. So let's get to it. So what's been going on this week? Um, our weekly recap section here. Um, pretty much business as usual. Um, the My new YouTube video went up yesterday, so that will be a regular Tuesday thing. Um, you know, I, I try to promote it, but I also try not to spam the hell out of the entire internet um, when, I, when I do that. So if you're following me either on Facebook, here on Instagram, on Twitter, if you're following my Pinterest boards, I put it in all those places. Um, so it's there. And then if you're subscribed to the YouTube, YouTube channel as well, which I would love if you would, um, you'll find it there and you'll get a notification about that once it goes live as well. So this one was on um, travel specifically um, and kind of geared towards um, you know, it, it talks about travel in, in all forms, like from day trips to vacations, but really geared more towards, you know, the several day trip where you're probably flying, you're going to try to make an attempt to stay on plan. One of the things that we talk about in that video, I say we, like it's me and my production crew. One of the things that I talk about in that video is... Um, uh, when you should or should not try to stay on plan um, when you're on a trip. So, you know, if you're taking a big vacation, for example, eh, you know what? I'm going to be the last guy that says that you should probably try to stay on plan for that. You know, enjoy the vacation. Just make sure that, it, you know, you're, you're planning that around things. Like if you're planning a vacation when you're four weeks out from a show, that just means you had a, a failure in planning. <laughs> So, um, because you're going to need to stay on plan and you know, that vacation is going to suck because of that. Um, and then um, one of the things that also is uh, that I did a little bit of research on there was um, really digging in on what TSA allows in airports, what you can take in there with you and what you can't. Um, and a lot of people don't know, but you can actually take a meal prep bag that's loaded up with food and you can get that through security. There are a couple of restrictions, a couple of limitations, but if you go and you watch that video, you'll get all the details on that. So. Um, one other thing for YouTube specifically, so I'm wearing, brace, brace your ears here, a little lapel mic <laughs> right there. Uh, it was uh, brought to my attention that when I use that, it's only coming in through one channel or one speaker. So I made a setting change and uh, I didn't get a chance to really test it beforehand. So we're going to see if that works better this time around. So it, uh, it does impact the YouTube videos um, that I recorded previously as well. So I'm hoping to get that fixed. Um, other than that, as far as the week goes, uh, pretty... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say boring because I'm busting my ass over here um, doing stuff, but uh, pretty pretty typical by the numbers. So we did have the Q and A session on Monday. Uh, I'm still open to looking at different times on that. So if anybody has any thoughts or suggestions they want to throw out, um, do so. I'll be happy to listen to that. Um, and I also wanted I, I talked about this in the Q and A, but I figured it was worth mentioning here. I just wanted to throw out a big congratulations to two people in particular, two of my clients, um, Arthur um, and Elia, both of who competed in their very first show this past weekend um, in Illinois. 
it was an NPC natural show. They both did really well. Arthur took fourth in his class um, out of seven, walked away with some hardware there in a first show, which is really good. And then um, Elia took fourth out of seven in her open class and took first in novice as well and walked away with uh, with the grand prize there. So congrats to them. And, and Elia, um, you know, we, we only worked together for about seven weeks. She was um, working with somebody else and they'd kind of, you know, um, you know, I, I won't, <laughs> I'll spare you the details, but um, she was kind of stuck. And so she came to me and we were able to drop about, about 10 or 11 pounds in those seven weeks. So um, it was a good time and uh, she really did a great job and Arthur just absolutely killed it. And, you know, I think I almost killed him in the process, but he's a tough cookie and he survived. So <laughs> it's, it's all good. Um, let's see, as far as uh, my week personally, um, it, it just goes to show you nothing is ever smooth in bodybuilding. I mean, if you, if you, experience a stretch and I've got a few clients like this where you have just week to week and month to month just everything's going by the books you need to understand that that is abnormal and it doesn't usually happen that way and part of it is you know you kind of make your own luck in a sense with that but you've got to also understand that you know dealing with uh, adversity of all kinds some of it major some of it minor is just you know life goes on whether you're whether you're trying to follow a bodybuilding lifestyle or not so you're going to deal with stuff you know um i've we're working with clients this week who got in a car accident, who hit somebody with their car, um, somebody who had a dog die, um, somebody going through some relationship difficulties. So, you know, all those things are going to continue to happen. So um, if you have a stretch where things are smooth sailing, just, you know, kick back and enjoy the ride and expect that that's not going to necessarily continue long term. As for me, um, just dealing with, you know, continuing to deal with stress, um, which is something that I continue to try to work on and, and get a little bit better at. Um, and uh, I believe also a little bit of stress-related heartburn. Um, so I actually um, threw my diet for a little bit of a loop this week. I'm trying to, you know, had to had to cut back on a couple meals, et cetera, but nothing too bad. Um, the, the biggest thing though is this elbow is um, getting definitely and progressively worse. So I'm going to try and get in, uh, get an opinion from my physical therapist friend again, but I anticipate this is going to lead to like probably a week or two out of the gym, which will not be fun, but if that's what I need to do, in order to, you know, stick with it long term, then I will do it because right now everything that I'm doing is just making it worse. I did arms today, pushed through triceps, no issue. I was able to get one bicep exercise in and then it said, no, no mas, no mas. So that sucked. Um, Okay, so uh, what else do we have here? Um, that was my week in a nutshell. I don't have a myth or a rant this week. Uh, it's kind of sad, kind of pathetic, but uh, I, I guess I'm just happy. I don't know. Or I've, I've ranted about everything. <laughs> I feel the need to. Um, I don't want to force it. You know, I only want it to be genuine. So, um, I mean, I could rant about plenty, I guess. But as far as bodybuilding related stuff, <laughs> the, the well is dry this week. So, um, so we're going to dive right in and um, stick with the two main topics here. So the first thing that I want to talk about is protein. So um, in bodybuilding, protein intake, a higher than average protein intake is certainly something that just comes with the territory. It is a pretty much essential. Um, common guidelines are, you know, seven tenths to one gram per pound of body weight. Um, let me see if I said that right. Seven tenths to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So if you are somebody who weighs, let's say 150 pounds, the seven tenths is gonna be da da da. So 105 up to 150 um, grams of protein for somebody who weighs 150 pounds. Those are the standard guidelines. Um, I do not necessarily buy into those specifically. I mean, I, I realize that the studies have been done, um, but there's also just heaps and heaps and just mountains of anecdotal evidence that says higher protein intake is better up to a point. Um, so I am at a point now with my coach where my protein intake is so high, it's a little absurd. And I don't necessarily agree that it needs to be that high, but he's driving the bus and I'm just a passenger on it. So I talked to him about it, but that's what we're doing. We're going to give it a shot. So mine right now being about 226 pounds, <laughs> my intake's right around 380. So when somebody says I have a hard time getting in hundred grams of protein a day, I just want to be like, Oh, you have no idea. 100 grams of protein. That's like that's like a large meal. <laughs> um, so yeah. Oh, to, to only have to get in 100 grams of protein. How easy would that be? So. Um, I want to talk about, you know, sources, you know, how you can hit your protein mark, especially if you are, um, especially if you are 
following a macro based plan and you have to um, devise your protein intake yourself. You know, what are the sources that you want? How important is variety? Um, protein powders, protein bars specifically. So we'll talk about some specific brands there, get some recommendations based on things that I've used. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I've used a lot of products. Most of them suck. <laughs> Most of them are crap. I'm not going to endorse too many of them. Um, and you know, if you've been watching this for any length of time, you know, my thoughts on supplementation, protein powders and protein bars are different. I don't consider those supplements just because they're food, basically. Um, you know, they have a significant caloric impact. A supplement would be something that doesn't. So like a pre-workout or a fat burner or whatever kind of, you know, toning gel BS garbage you want to slather on your body that doesn't do anything. So, um, when it comes to when it comes to protein, though, I would consider those foods. So there are some good products, there are some bad products. So um, overall, one of the things that I always advocate it's the way that I write meal plans, and when I do macro based plan for macro based plans for clients, also, um, you know, it's not just a free for all. Like I say, here are your numer numerical targets, and then let's go over some additional guidelines here. And one of those is that every meal, and we're defining a meal as any time during the day that you open your mouth and put food in it. So this is kind of to discourage encourage grazing, like all day grazing. So actually having defined meal times and the time is not important, but okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to make something, I'm going to eat it, and then I'm going to not eat for a little while. So we're going to have a meal, you know, you can call them snacks, whatever, but I'm going to call them meals. So anytime you open your mouth and put food in it, all of those meals have to feature a complete protein source. Um, and a complete protein source, by that I just mean it, it refers to the amino acid profile. So um, it has a complete amino acid profile. There are no amino acids, essential or non-essential, that are missing. So something like, let's talk about um, beans, for example. So you look at the nutrition facts um, for a can of black beans. Oh, for a carb source, this is pretty high in protein. It's got like, you know, however much, like 10 grams of protein per serving or something like that. Great. It is not a complete protein source. It does not have a fully fleshed out amino acid profile. Same thing with rice. So rice is, is much lower in protein, but it does have some trace protein in there for a carb source. You know, if you're looking to get a, a, a 25 gram serving of protein from rice, you're going to be looking at like 400 grams of carbs. So it's definitely skewed a little bit. But um, the reason why rice and beans go together so well, I mean, first of all, it's just tasty, but also they they together, they complement the deficient amino acids in one another. So the two of those together form a complete protein. So if I was going to try to assemble a meal here, I'm, I've got my spreadsheet open over here. So um, let's see. So we're going to pick white rice. This is a spreadsheet that I use for all my meal plan creation. Um, where are the black beans? Here they are. So, um, yeah, so let's take a look here. Let's go, oh heck, let's go half a cup there. Da, 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 da. Let's go 120 grams there. So Instagram, I'm taking you for a ride here. Hold on. Oh, that's my thumb. So what you can see there kind of is, um, I've got my, uh, my spreadsheet here that I use for my um, meal plan creation. So uh, it's got foods in here so I can pick columns, et cetera. So I've got a couple of carb columns. So in one of them I picked you know, 10 grams white rice and I'm putting a multiplier of 12 on that. So it's giving me macros for 120 gram serving of rice. And then one cup black beans, I put a one half multiplier on that. So it's a half cup. So 120 grams rice, half cup black beans. That comes out to da, 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 12 grams of protein and 54 grams of carbs. So you look at, you know, all these foods and I see this posted on Instagram pretty regularly. Like these are non animal sources that are high in protein. And it's like, you know, broccoli, peas, beans, blah, blah. And it's all this crap. And I mean, you know, sure. These are things that are high in protein and they're, they're sources of protein, et cetera. First of all, they're sources of carbs more than they are sources of protein. So if you're going to hit your protein target, your carbs are going to be through the damn roof. Um, and then by and large, they are mostly incomplete sources. Now, an ex a, a exception to that would be something like quinoa, which is a complete protein source, but once again, it is primarily a carb. So if you were relying on something like that to be a complete protein, you better have a really high carb allowance, and you're still going to have to supplement that with some other kind of complete protein source. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, whenever you've got something that has trace protein in it, you know, it, it isn't necessarily something that's going to be productive for protein synthesis in the body. If there are amino acids that are missing, then you're not getting the your bang for your buck out of that. So that's why it's difficult to follow a vegetarian diet and be a bodybuilder. Difficult, not impossible. It can certainly be done. And there are degrees of vegetarian 
pescatarianism from like, you know, I'm a lacto ovo pescatarian, so you can still have, you know, dairy, eggs and fish all the way to vegan. So um, there are there are shades along there. <laughs> vegan is hard. I'm not going to lie. It's still doable, but it's hard. And I've worked with plenty of vegans in the past. Um, and, you know, some some people with a little bit more flexibility, suddenly it becomes a lot easier. So um, uh, where was I going with that? Lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, so complete protein sources then. I mean, what are complete protein sources? Well, the answer is pretty clear. A complete protein source, uh, you can guarantee, there are exceptions like quinoa, et cetera, um, and a couple others. None of them are particularly noteworthy or common. Um, uh, soy is another one, um, but also uh, anything that comes from an animal is a complete protein source. So that is why vegetarians have a harder time of it. So um, any kind of chicken, turkey, pork, steak, beef, red meat, anything like that, yes. Um, any kind of dairy is a complete protein source. Now, if you look at things like you know milk, cheese, etc., those things are going to be you know probably a little bit more fat heavy than they are protein. So again, you them primarily as a protein source is going to be a little bit tricky and then also there are you know um, digestive enzyme issues with dairy a lot of people struggle with that too so it's another thing to consider um, but in that dairy category would also be um, whey protein um, or any other kind of protein powder you can get lactose free um, protein powders as well which is what I use so um, lots of things there um, and uh, probably missing something but my my <laughs> talking here is so fragmented it's hard it's hard for me to keep my my thoughts straight in my head um i should have had some fish oil before i started this maybe keep my brain straight um so when we're looking at protein sources, um, we need a, every meal has to have a complete protein source. So, and the, the reason for that is because that is how protein synthesis occurs in the body when all those amino acids are present in sufficient quantities. So, if you have deficiencies here and there, you're going to uh, your rate of protein synthesis, which is what we use to build muscle, is going to take a hit in the body. Um, I also encourage everybody to spread their protein intake evenly throughout the day and avoid giant protein bombs. So, um, the reason for this. And a lot of people will say, you know, that the common thinking out there is, well, you have to eat several small meals a day to keep your metabolism going, which is just factually untrue and it's been proven so many different times it's not necessary however there are other advantages that have nothing to do with your metabolism so first of all uh, a lot of people will find it's just a little bit more comfortable um, to eat like five average size meals versus two or three really big ones so um, just as far as you know what's easier to digest what's easier to sit down and take in etc I put myself in that category as well if I had to sit down and eat a, a thousand calorie meal versus a 600 calorie meal uh, I'm going to feel that. And even if I did it less frequently, it's going to put me out for a little bit longer. And for me in particular, it's going to make me want to take a damn nap after I eat every time. So um, not terribly productive. Um, so keeping your protein intake spread out throughout the day. And I, I'll, I advocate something along the lines of, you know, five to six meals a day. And there, there's wiggle room for that. It doesn't always have to be the same. Um, but what I do when I'm determining, you know, when I'm writing a plan or the guidelines that I provide for my clients that do macro-based plans um, is just take your protein target, whatever it is, we're just, let's just say for sake of argument here is 150 grams. Um, and just divide that by the number of meals you want to have in a day. And so if you're going to have six, great. You're going to get in roughly 25 grams of protein per meal. Um, the reason why we want that um, spread out pretty evenly throughout the day is so that we maintain a state of positive nitrogen balance. So nitrogen is a byproduct of protein assimilation. When there is a surplus of nitrogen in the body, it leaves it in a more anabolic slash muscle building state. So that's why protein intake throughout the day is a little bit more beneficial. So <clears throat> When you, when you look at those numbers, you're like, okay, 150 grams, great. Now we divide that by six. So, okay, I'm gonna have six meals. So they're all about 25. Now you can start to see, okay, what are the things that are gonna get me to that 25 gram mark? And, you know, is it critical that it's exactly 25? No, what, what's important is that you hit 150 as the target every, every day. So if there's a meal that's 20 and a meal that's 30, that's fine. If you've got a meal that's five and a meal that's 40, Five? <laughs> five and 45? No, that, that's not good. So um, you want it more even than that. That, that five gram serving is, is really insufficient for, for any kind of realistic protein synthesis in the body. So um, 
just be mindful of what the target is, um, what, what your average per meal should be. And then when you are putting together your plan, if it's a macronutrient based plan, and I certainly encourage everybody to put together a plan rather than just wing it and try to make every day different because um, you're gonna spend a lot more time doing that. It's, it's much more time consuming, it's much less efficient. The margin for error goes way up as well. So um, aim for that target and try to get within a few grams of it and just know, okay, if I can do like 22 here, I need to have one meal that's a little bit over. So where I find people um, have difficulties with that is if they say, okay, I'm gonna have a meal that is, you know, Greek yogurt. Okay, great, that's fine. So you take this thing and you look at it and you're like, all right, this, this one has 16 grams of protein in here. Great, okay. So now you're gonna wanna supplement that with something else. Um, otherwise, you're gonna be you know, about nine grams short. So you, you could make that up with going nine grams over another meal or you could just add a little something to that meal to get the protein up to a higher average where it needs to be either a larger serving size of yogurt like you know even two of those would be okay or um you know i always uh, encourage people to get plain greek yogurt because you know it's lower in carbs lower in sugar etc and then you can just add some protein powder to it so it's plain and then you add some like you know strawberry flavored protein powder great just like half a scoop get an extra 12 grams in there and then suddenly you change that 15 up to like a 27 or something like that, woohoo, we win. Yes, so um, that, that's good. There's, <laughs> that gets us closer to the average. Um, it, a, lo a lot of people, especially people who are just starting out and really struggling to get their protein intake up to where it needs to be, um, they'll take, okay, well, my, my 25 gram average is where I wanna be, and then, okay, this meal's 22, this one's 16, this one's 19, and you know the average only works if you've got some that are low and some that are high. So um, otherwise you end up in, you know, your, your end of the day target of 150 is closer to like a 120, 125. And, you know, I mean, the targets are set for a reason. So we want to hit those. And one of the, I, I get some people who will ask me like, why is it so important that I hit those numbers? And like, well, at, at the highest level, we want to hit those targets because I want to see how your body responds at those targets, not some arbitrary targets that you're hitting that are close to that. But I want to see what those tar what what kind of response we get at those targets, and then we can adjust them from there, and then see what makes sense. So. Um, that, that's why it's important. So if we're looking at a variety of protein sources, this is a question that came up, um, I believe it was uh, Dean, a client of mine who posed this. Um, he said, you know, how important is it to get a variety of protein sources? And he had heard um, uh, something from, uh, I think it was Ben Pakulski, who's a smart dude and I really respect him saying, you know, get in sources like, you know, elk and deer and this kind of stuff. And I mean, you know, you, you can, find bodybuilders by the truckload who have never taken in those protein sources and have done just fine. So um, the thought that any protein source is essential is stupid. And that's not what Ben was saying. Um, he, he was just advocating a variety of protein sources. And I agree with that for a slightly different reason. Um, and I didn't look into the study that he was citing there, but um, I know that if, if Ben is making a recommendation on something, it's because of something that he found in a study. <laughs> and because he's a smart dude and he digs into that stuff. Um, I take a more practical approach, um, not bro sciencey approach, but more practical in that whatever the study finds is going to be less significant than, I mean, like if it's, you know, some percentage more effective to get in a variety of protein sources or these specific protein sources or whatever, um, that's going to be less significant than the practical effect, which is a variety of protein sources makes your diet more interesting and it makes it easier to stick to in the long term. So if you have chicken, four or five damn meals a day, um, if you can sustain that for longer than a month, you're a freaking superhero <laughs> because not many people can. So getting in a variety of protein sources simply helps with a long-term adherence. And if you can work it so that, you know, if you're eating six meals a day and all six of them are different protein sources, that's great. That variety is gonna do you wonders, not because of something that can be clinically proven, but just because you're likely to stick with that plan and be more uh, compliant and adherent to it in the long term. And you know, as you know, you've listened to me talk about this um, at length in the past. Um, bodybuilding is about long-term adherence. It's about the marathon, not the sprint. So I think um, I think that uh, variety is important more for that reason than for anything else. Um, so we look at um, the, the standard, you know, animal-based protein sources like chicken, turkey, um, pork is less common, but um, I know that that uh, that's out there. And I, one of the things that I always ask for my clients and their new uh, their new client assessment is like, here's a list of foods 
put a check by anything that you don't want to see in a meal plan. And I tell you what, I think pork probably gets checked about 70% of the time. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> I should uh, I should go back and look at some of those things. So other ones, um, you'd be surprised how many people don't like rice. Um, how many people have strong aversions to most fat sources like avocado, coconut oil, walnuts, um, almonds, peanut butter, which I think is weird, but peanut butter comes up a lot. It's something that people don't like. Anyway, that's total, total tangential point, but it was a curiosity. Um, so red meat like beef, steak, etc. Understand that your fat, um, your trace fats are going to be higher in those. Um, you can certainly get some cuts that have more fat than they do protein. Um, so just be be mindful of that. Um, Greek yogurt is a good one. Not a favorite of mine. I can't stand the stuff actually, but I know it's out there. It's an option. I write it in plans for people if they, if they uh, if they if they uh, have indicated that they're open to that. Um, protein powders and bars are what I really wanted to get to though. So um, when we're looking at recommendations, I get a lot of people that say I need something you know something that I can keep in my desk at work or something that I can take with me um, to uh, you know get in a meal if I don't have time to do this or that or the other thing. I'm like, all right, cool. So first of all. First thing you want to do is minimize the minimize those situations. <laughs> so um, don't if you find yourself in a bind like that where it's the same meal like multiple times in a week where you can't hit it. We need to reevaluate some things, um, and you know maybe not huge things, big big massive changes in plan, but something ain't working because we don't want to have to rely on a fallback. And a, something like a protein bar should really only be a fallback because. Almost universally speaking, they are crap. Um, and yes, I, I put Quest bars in that category too. I know a lot of people are really big fans of those things, but I am less of a fan. Um, mostly because, you know, when they first came out, I was like, hey, these are pretty good. You know, I mean, you know, it, it's relatively clean. You know, the macros are, are manageable, etc. But I don't know if something changed, but more and more, like whenever I have one now, it's like this just does not taste good. I mean, you, you open it up and it's just this big stuff. I mean, it looks like, it, <laughs> it looks like something out of like the movie Soylent Green. I mean, it's just like, it's a big old hunk of just crap. Uh, and I, I know like you microwave it for five seconds or whatever and it gets kind of gooey. I'm like, I'm just not a fan. I, I've tried so many different flavors of that and you know, I can eat one every now and then, but other than that, it's just like, ugh, no, nah, this is not good. Um, and I know they tout, um, you know, oh, well, we've only got so many ingredients here, so it's a nice clean food. I'm like, well, yeah, but you know, it, it does have the natural flavors. I think pretty much all of the bars have that as one of the ingredients, which, you know, it, there's nothing natural about it. It means it's derived from natural sources, but it's as synthetic and processed as anything could possibly be. Um, and they're really high on, Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. <laughs> she, she commented on my shirt. Uh, you know, I, I wear it just for the comments, actually. So um, I could actually wear a, uh, a Star Wars shirt for every day of the week, I think. Maybe I'll do that in subsequent weeks. Uh oh. My microphone slipped. Technical difficulties. Sorry to all you YouTubers out there that just had your ears blown out. <laughs> so, um,. Uh, oh, the other thing that Quest bars have is um, they're, they're high in sugar alcohols usually, which can cause some stomach upset for people. I know they're really high in fiber, um, but it's been my experience that it's not necessarily the highest quality of fiber. Um, so if you're relying on that for your fiber intake to help keep your regularity on point, eh, I'm probably not going to do the trick um, just because it's, it's a big old bomb of it. And I find that uh, fiber in smaller doses, but perhaps more frequently is usually more effective. But uh, and I think their fiber is like, um, it's like corn derived or something like that, which would not be my first um, choice for fiber in any circumstance. So, um, so not really a big fan of bars. Um, if there was one that I was going to recommend, it would just be totally as a guilty pleasure. And those are the Gatorade protein bars because holy crap, those things taste amazing. Pretty much all of them, except they have some vanilla almond one or vanilla something or other, um, which kind of tastes disgusting. But like the cookies and cream one, it's like just melt, melt that sucker down and just cover me in it and like I, I will I will take a bath in that I mean that is it's so good and they've got like a chocolate crisp one and a, a chocolate caramel one they are so good the macros on those eh, a little dicey <laughs> not so much but um, you know the protein is kind of low it's about 20 grams which most of the protein bars that you find are gonna have a, um, a protein serving that is great for women not so hot for guys so um, I think those bars are typically around like 20 40 15 protein carbs fats so you know and they're they're really high 
high on the sugars as well. So um, a protein bar, if you're gonna use it, post-workout's great. Um, outside of that window, probably not so much. And something like a Quest bar, for women, I would say very good. For guys, uh, well, again, I wouldn't say very good, but I'd say it's a better option for women than it is for guys. For guys, you know, it's just, they're, they're like, you know, 180 calories, you know, I mean, it's, it, it ain't really going to cut it as far as a meal goes. So um, it, it, not my recommendation. Um, as far as protein powders go, I am, um, may, maybe it's just because I'm such a loyal individual and human being, I don't know, but over the past 15, 18 years, I have primarily used just two protein powders and that's it. I've experimented with a whole bunch of others um, and I can, I can comment on some of those. Um, but uh, the ones that I've stuck with are, um, well, three actually, Dimatize Elite Whey, which is just a standard, no frills, uh, whey isolate product, which is perfectly fine. I actually really like the texture and the taste of it. Um, I think it's really good. Um, uh, Dimatize ISO 100, which is partially hydrolyzed as well. And you know, they say it's a hydrolyzed protein. Well, it contains some hydrolyzed protein. It's not purely hydrolyzed. So, uh, you know, you, you get what you pay for. Um, but that, that is likewise good. And what I use now is actually IsoPure, um, just because I got really, really anal retentive about my macronutrients. Um, and I wanted something that had no carbs, no fats. So I went with IsoPure. Bonus, it's lactose free. So um, for a guy like me, that is pretty much essential. Um, once I, once I hit about 37, 38, my body's like, hey, dairy, mm, not so much. So, um, so I, I superior for me all the way, absolutely. Uh, other products that I've used that um, I can speak to, um, Optimum Nutrition Gold Standard, I know is a really common protein product out there. Um, I find it to be nasty. Um, I don't care for it. Um, I use it post-workout just because I, I, I got their Hydro Way, actually, which um, um, I wanted something that was exclusively hydrolyzed for post-workout. The cookies and cream flavor is passable. Um, it's all right, it does okay, but the rest of them like their, their chocolate flavor. I mean, I don't know how you screw up chocolate anything, but they managed to do it. I think it's disgusting. Um, and then you've got other products, uh, things that are really common like Syntha 6 by BSN, which has possibly like the crappiest macronutrients of any protein powder I've ever seen. Just loaded up with trace carbs, sugars, fats in a protein powder. I don't want any of that stuff. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want that. So. Um, um, let's see what else there are other products out there like you know um, there's which you know certainly not essential um, you know unless you have something that prevents you from having anything that is that is based on whey so beef is a good alternative for that you could also go with egg white protein it just depends if you have any dietary restrictions there that is that is the main reason why i'd go with something like that those products are typically going to come at a premium as far as cost goes um, so i would i would stick with something a little bit more standard fare just a uh, whey a lactose free product um, and avoid you know the, the more exotic you know beef egg white proteins etc unless you really need to so um so that's protein in a nutshell, uh, kind of basic 101 level stuff there. Um, so I wanted to move on to gym etiquette and for the people that are um, on Instagram, hey, I know you're there. Um, I want to hear your your tips, your stories, your horror stories, um, anything like that. I, I made a list of some of my big ones here. We're going to start with some of the more obvious stuff and then um, get a little bit a uh, little bit deeper into the weeds. So anything that you've got for me on the topic of gym etiquette, throw it out right now. Whatever uh, wh whatever uh, gets your gears grinding, I want to know about it. So um, the first one, of course, you know, whenever somebody talks about gym etiquette, the first thing is squat rack. And why is that? Well. It's it's because most gyms, if they have any, they have like one or two. So what you do in that squat rack matters. <laughs> uh, and the last time I did legs, you know, the gym that I go to, it's got two full cage squat racks. It's got a hydraulic rack. Um, it's got two, two partial racks um, where they have, you know, adjustable spotting arms, but it's not a full enclosure. Um, and then there's a slew. I think there's about four stations around like an octagon that they, that is most commonly used for like group fitness where they've got barbell cradles out there. So you could squat there, no spotting mechanism set up there. So you're not going to do max weight stuff out there or anything like that. But so this gym, there's, there's a lot of places where you can squat. So I'm kind of spoiled there still finding one of the cages. Um, if you want to use that is it can be a little bit tricky. So uh, I, I went in for legs on Sunday. I think I, I spent about 25 minutes in the squat rack. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm also looking around and like making sure that one of the others is still open. And if, if everything's in use, then I'm going to get out of there pretty quickly. So I was squatting though. So 
Um, what do you do in the squat rack? Well, I mean, you know, you squat. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's called a rack or a power rack or a cage, but it's colloquially known as a squat rack because that is the primary thing that you do in there. What else do people do in there? Well, the major dumbasses will go in there and curl. And of course, we've all heard that before. Don't curl in the squat rack. I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, uh, a lot of guys will go in there and do bench um, in a squat rack. So th that's a proper use for it, I would say. Same thing with overhead press because you know you need something to catch the bar, especially if you don't have a spotter. I mean, that, that's one way you can go and have equipment do the spotting for you. So um, I, I think it's a little bit silly just because I see a lot of guys going and doing like max rep work and they're like, you know, hitting sets of 10, 15, 18 in a, in a squat rack and they're doing bench in there. I'm like, is save that for the guys doing or the guys and the gals that are doing like five or less you know i'm <laughs> saving for the heavy stuff if you're just trying to push some weight just go grab a bench somewhere um deadlift in a squat rack stop it the only thing you need for a deadlift is some open floor space if you are deadlifting in a squat rack you are the problem and i, I know deadlifting is cool but just go grab some floor space somewhere do not occupy a rack with your damn deadlifts it's totally unessential um barbell row typically not necessarily necessary. Find a barbell. Um, this is actually a better exercise to do at a bench press station um, because you don't need the rack. You don't need something that's going to spot you when you're doing a barbell row. If you do, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, so you can just stand at a bench station, grab the bar, row, put it back on the cradles. And typically most gyms are going to have more of those available than they will squat racks. All of these rules go out the, out the door. If you're lifting at like 2 a.m. or you're the only person in the gym or whatever, do whatever you want. Um, just be mindful of, you know, if, if there's only one squat rack and you're the only per and you're, uh, you're the only person in there but somebody else comes in and they're like hey you know can you stop curling in there i'd like to squat then yeah i mean i think they have that right um romanian deadlifts again um no just grab a barbell somewhere do it somewhere else um all you need for that is you know i mean you could do it off the floor i like to have something that will hold the bar at about you know knee height so i don't have to go all the way down to grab it but you certainly don't need a rack for that so save the the rack for things that require spotting because that is the primary function of a rack to spot for you so um Speaking of racks, there's also the dumbbell rack. So um, do's and don'ts for the dumbbell rack. It's pretty easy. What, what is the purpose of a dumbbell rack? The purpose of it is to hold dumbbells. The purpose of it is not to prop you up while you perform an exercise or, or for you to stand your stupid ass right in front of it while you do curls or lateral raises. Um, damn it, that's annoying. It is so annoying. Uh, I start to just lose myself a little bit here. Um, grab your dumbbells take a step back or two so people can walk in front of you they can access things and you're not blocking them off because the other thing is you know you're sitting there you're doing your exercise people can't like get in front of you and make eye contact eye contact with you unless you're looking in the mirror and you make eye contact with them that way so you're, you're in the way and you're oblivious to everything else that's going on around you although realistically if you're grabbing stuff off the dumbbell rack and you're just doing your exercise there you're probably oblivious to a lot of things in your life so uh just grab your stuff, get out of the way, don't stand in front of it. Um, another thing is using uh, gym equipment as a place to just leave your crap. Um, I, 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 I hate it. The, a floor is good for that. A gym bag is good for that. The floor is good for your gym bag. Don't leave your nonsense uh, on a bench somewhere. Especially, I mean, all this stuff should be really obvious if you are in a crowded gym, which I mean, uh, again, if you've listened to this for any length of time, you know that, you know, my, my entire life is built around getting to the gym at a time when it's less crowded. So that's, that's part of the reason I, I got into doing online coaching is so, Hey, I can go, I can go to the gym at 10 in the morning when nobody's there. I mean, you know, it, it's a bonus. So don't, don't put your stuff on the equipment. Um, please, please. Uh, and corollary to that, there's one thing that you should put on the equipment and that is a towel. Please carry around a towel with you because nobody wants your sweat stains. Um, because I, I, I mean, I realize I'm preaching to the choir here because if you're listening to this, you probably already know a lot of these things, but, and you know, the people that need to hear this stuff are the people that don't listen to a podcast like this. So, um, but nonetheless, I find it's a cathartic experience. We're going to get this off our chest. We're going to heal as a group here, right? So, um, if you're not carrying around a towel, chances are you're probably not going to clean up after yourself, um, with the sweat stain that you left on the bench, which is just gross. Ugh, it just makes my skin, skin crawl. So, um, 
When, when the gym is crowded, if you're just standing around taking up space, you are the problem. Keep moving, do some work. If you're gonna talk somewhere, go out of the way. Don't stand in front of the equipment, don't lean on something, don't make somebody come up to you and say, hey, are you using that when they know you're not because you're making them feel rude just because you're standing around like a, a bump on a log. Um, do not, and this is something that, that happened today and the guy was nice about it. Um, well, uh, I, I was nice about it and the guy, <laughs> the guy, he understood that what he was doing was, you know, not, not super helpful. Um, do not expect people to pay attention to all the things that you're trying to superset. So if you're, as, as was the case today, some dude is way over there and then he comes all the way back over here to use something at the cable. I don't see him anywhere. I'm like, I'm going in for the cable. All right. And then he comes up, Hey, can I get in one more set? Yeah, sure, buddy. Whatever. Um, just don't expect people to pay attention to what you're doing because they probably have their own stuff to worry about. Um, and and when you superset, you know, you're, you're leaving something, you're going somewhere else, you're using two pieces of equipment, um, you know, you're, you, you, it's not like you can save your, it's not like you're saving a seat or anything like that. You know, if you're not standing at something, somebody has every right to, to come in and use it and, you know, probably work in with you, which is fine. Just don't get upset like, oh, so-and-so is messing up my superset. Well, you know, find a better superset, something that you can do with one piece of equipment. <laughs> that would be a better way to do it. Um, uh, one of the things that I wrote here was run around like a jackass. <laughs> so a, a lot of people will, you know, they'll superset, but then they're going to sprint from one exercise to the next because got to keep that heart rate up or whatever. I don't know. Um, that's annoying. It's, uh, unsafe. I've almost been run over many times in gyms before by people like that. So, um, no fun, no fun. Um, if you are not in a CrossFit gym, um, understand, um, the value in a negative. Um, and I'm talking about people who are doing cleans, jerks, snatches, and then they'll just drop whatever it is from overhead. I know I've ranted about this in the past. Um, it scares the living hell out of me. And I swear if I'm in the middle of like a bench rep or something like that, and I'm struggling and I hear something like that, I'm probably going to drop the bar on myself. So, I mean, maybe it's just because I get startled really easily. I don't know. Um, but it drives me insane. And there was one guy in there today. It's like, he knew that I was going to be talking about this and he was deadlifting. And his whole thing was, I'm going to stand up and then I'm just going to drop the bar completely. Like not even make an attempt at a negative. And I don't know what it was. It was probably like 400 pounds or something like that. You could have heard that thing from a mile away um, and in a confined gym with music blaring when it feels like the music is cut out to make sonic room for this weight that gets dropped um, that that is excessive so if you can lift it you can at least impart some kind of control in your negative as well um, you know look at power lifters who were pulling eight, 900 pounds. And you know, clearly they're not going to have a slow controlled negative, but they're also typically not just going to stand up and then drop the damn weight. So, um, keep in mind also that there is value in the negative portion of a rep, regardless of what you're doing. So, um, the next thing I wrote, less talking, more lifty, please. If you're going to be a jabber jaw, if you're showing up and it's jaw day, um, just make sure you're out of the way. Just make sure, just be, be aware of everybody else around you. Um, and that other people are there to work and let them please. Um, <clears throat> guys, Ladies, you can go away for a second. Guys, I'm going to talk to you here. Um, YouTube, Instagram, anybody who's there, um, don't, don't actually go away. Just like, you know, whatever. Um, guys, don't be creeps. Just don't, don't, don't be creeps. Um, regardless of what they're wearing, women are more than likely not there in the gym for you to hit on. So forget it, get your work in, let them get their work in as well. They don't want your tips. They don't want your advice. They don't want to tell you about their diet. Oh, are you prepping for a show? You look good, but nobody cares. Shut up, do your work. Don't be a creep. Okay. Gym owners, this one is for you specifically. Um, so pay attention. Um, it is impossible to find a gym out there that does not have TVs everywhere. I wish it were possible. I would love to go in a gym and just have music and no visuals on the walls. This gym where I go, thankfully, you know, I mean, they've got like sports center, da, 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 whatever. And then they've got a couple TVs just dedicated to YouTube channels, um, that where they're showing like, you know, bodybuilding related, or there's like some powerlifting YouTube videos or whatever, which is great. All right, cool. I'm down with that. Um, gym owners keep the news and the politics off the TVs. 
uh, I don't care what your leaning is, but anybody who's going into the gym, if you're putting that stuff on TV, all you're gonna do is either distract people or piss people off. So be neutral, just throw it away. Keep it gym centric. So sports, yeah, that's fine. Um, that's totally cool. But other than that, I, I also would just like to start a movement where we have gyms with fewer TVs on so that there's fewer distractions. We can just go in, do the work. Everybody's got headphones in anyway. You're blaring music throughout the gym, so it's not like we're getting anything other than the visuals. So if you want people to stop what they're doing, get a less effective workout, so they can stare at the screen and read the closed captioning on there, great, that's a great way to do it. If you want people to put in a more concentrated effort and put in better work and focus less on being entertained while they're doing it, um, then turn off the TVs, donate them, sell them, whatever, but just unplug. It would be really good if we could start a movement where we have like, I, I'll start a chain, I'm gonna call it Unplugged Fitness where there's no TVs inside. So anyway, that's it. So. That, that's my, my gym etiquette 101. So um, that's what I got. So, so everybody, please just stop doing all that stuff. Stop pissing me off and then everybody's gonna be just fine. So I know I'm not alone on that stuff. Um, there'll be more. There'll probably be a volume two of gym etiquette at some point down the road because every day I go and I see something else, I'm like, oh, I gotta add that to the list, yep. Um, but that's it. So we talked protein, we talked gym etiquette, and um, we talked about my elbow as well. And <laughs> I know, oh God, it hurts so bad right now. I'm not even doing anything. I mean, I'm podcasting for Christ's sake and my elbow's killing me. So um, clearly I need some help. So I'll keep you posted on what happens there. So um, I appreciate y'all for watching. So everybody who is um, on Instagram live, thank you. Everybody who is on uh, YouTube checking this out, thank you. And then if you're listening, um, wherever you may be, if you found this through iTunes, Google Play, or directly through the website at fivestarphysique.com, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. So we will be back next week. Um, well, hold on. Let, let me think about this for a second. Um, Dean says, late as usual. It's okay, man. It's all good. Um, so next week is Thanksgiving week. I'm gonna be here, so I'm still gonna be doing this at uh, 12.30 next week, I do believe. Um, if that changes, I'll make sure that everybody is made aware of it. But um, you know, I don't have enough of these where I can just run like a, a best of or anything like that. So <laughs> I don't have anything, any material to fall back on. So we'll plan on being here for next week. So anyway, that's all I got. So I appreciate everybody for sticking around. Thank you. Um, if you've got questions in the meantime, um, you can email me, Darren at fivestarfitness.com. Check me out on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Spotify, um, and the website, fivestarphysique.com. Thank you all for watching and or listening, and I'll see you next week.